Hello, my name is Beth Wyman, Commodore of the Inland Lake Yachting Association. One of our strategic goals is to maximize sailors' performance through education. With that in mind, the ILY Promotions Committee is creating and distributing a series of webinars which taps into our own ILY sailors' knowledge. The series will have six to 10 episodes, and I'd like to thank the ILY Foundation for the Education Grant and Salesing for making this project possible. To learn more about Salesing, go to salesing.com to learn how to improve knowledge on other on-water skills. Continuing with webinar number two is Stephanie Robel and Maggie Shea. They recently climbed to a world ranking of number four and qualified to compete in the Tokyo Olympics in 2021. To learn more about them and their trek, please visit robelsheasailing.com. So now sit back and enjoy and maybe take some notes. We hope you enjoy this 60 minute webinar, which will be followed by a question and answer session. On with the show, episode two, the starting sequence. All right, everyone, just want to say a huge welcome to you all and thank you for joining us. Thank you guys for having us back. We are really excited to be here. So we're going to start it off with a fancy poll. We would like to tell you how we view starting strategy. Um, basically, we love to quote Dave Perry, and when we were match racing, he taught us that you want to be on time, on the line, and at full speed, right? And that's a great concept, um, but when, and, and it works really well in match racing, but what we found it helps a lot more in flea racing, actually, is to also think about, do you have the ability to do what you want to do? Like, if you want to sail straight forever and go to that left side, can you do that? If you want to go to the right side, can you tack? Do you have options? Or are your decisions really dictated by the boats around you? So, um, we like to think about that, like when we when we uh, grade our starts, can we can we were we able to do what we wanted to do, and that's what dictates a good start or not. Um, and so we also have a question that we'd like you guys to answer in the chat box, and uh, there are no wrong answers, no judgment here, but we just want to know what you think about when does the race begin. So go ahead, and I'm going to rely on Steph to monitor those chat answers because um, I'm in presenter mode here. So when does the race begin? What do you guys think? Uh, when would you say you have like started the race or when, yeah, when do you start making questions? So we're gonna let you guys pop those answers in the chat questions and share with you um, a race, a tracking from one of our races at the World Championship. So this is a Gold Fleet race and it is, uh, it was on a day that the breeze was coming off the land and it was kind of shifty and puffy. Um, but so let me tell you in this program, the wind is directly from uh, up, so it's directly from the top of your screen, um, and the wind is square to the greater course that you're seeing. So uh, I'm telling you that because the line bias that you see in the in the video is true. So there's a little bit of a pin line bias. You know, the pin is a little higher than the than the boat. Okay, so this is af just after the gun. Boats are starting to cross the line, and in this program, there's like a yellow line that goes across the across the um, screen that shows where the GPS tracking is showing us that the, you know, that who's winning. That's, that's like the winning ladder rung, basically. Um, so at this point, it looks like the boats that started at the pin are slightly ahead because they took advantage of that line bias and they are, uh, you know, distance wise ahead. And then we can see the boats that we've highlighted in the middle are in like 24th or 10th or 12th or whatever it might be. I just highlighted that boat on the left. That's Germany. And if we were to play out the whole race, you'll see that they actually didn't win. So um, it looks like they're way ahead here, but it's a, it's a really shifty and puffy day. And what I want you to keep an eye on is these boats on the right that started on port, and now they're getting closer and closer to that leader line. Um, and the reason I'm pointing this out is because on these shifty, puffy days, we would argue that this is where the race begins because that right phase was the first really big um, thing to happen. You know, it's like that was the first big change that occurred and the first advantage was gained by take by getting in, into that puff. And so we would say being able to take advantage of that rate or that puff there was really important. And that's where the race began. Yeah. And on that note, we only had one person brave enough to answer our question, which okay. is at the five minute gun, which was what I said as well. When this question was asked to me. So it's a little bit of a trick question and just like a lot of things in sailing, it depends. So 
Good answer from Ella, um, five minute gun. Love it. Um, okay, cool. Five minute gun, okay, so then let's take a look. Here's another start. This was a really different day. This day was, um, in our forecast on this day, it said, anticipate the breeze to be persistently going left. You know, the forecast was pretty straightforward. It was like, hey, you're racing to the left side. Um, there was actually a clearing in the clouds on the left side. Uh, there was more pressure over there. There were a million reasons to race left. So if you were on our chat last week when we talked about the different types of race courses, this would be like a textbook somewhere to race to. Um, so on the one hand, there's like line bias at the pin, but on the other hand, there's also reason to go left. And so, um, so Steph, I'll ask you, what, <laughs> when would you say this race began? Um, I think I could say two things. The race either began, you know, a minute before the start or at, at go. Um, you're really, you're at go, having a good lane and being able to race left is, is the priority here. And that's, that's when the race started. Yeah, totally. So when the race, it was kind of a true question that we posed, when the race begins, um, depends on the kind of day, depends on the race course, depends on the priorities. And so in this race, it's to sail straight and to make it to that left side. And you can see boats are like tacking out if their lane wasn't good. And then they'll tack back on the hips of boats going, uh, sailing straight on starboard. And so every inch you were behind that line or every inch you were away from that pin, pack the pin, you're behind, right? And you're not gonna, you don't have so many opportunities to gain that back. So we just wanted to take those two um, examples to illustrate like, the different kinds of starts and the different kind of priorities. And, and um, if we threw around any like lingo that didn't quite make sense, we're gonna totally unpack what we were just talking about uh, in the next couple slides, but it's just a little taste of it. How lucky are we to have a program like this? I love it. Super helpful. Yeah. All right, so I'm, I'm sure we've all experienced at one point or another that feeling when you come off the line and you just absolutely crush the start. Your, your lane to lure of you is really good. Your speed is locked in. You're just absolutely crushing it. And the first decision, the, the decision point that we were just talking about, becomes a lot easier. You know right away, okay, I've got clear air. I can just kind of, you know, everything kind of just falls into place. Whereas if you had a bad start, you, your first decision is made for you. Um, so getting a good start really allows you to master and have that first decision be a lot easier for you. So today we're going to go through where to start, how to start, and the mentality of starting. So there's a lot to factor in when you're making a game plan um, for where to start, and it can actually be a really hard decision to make because the start plays such a major role in how you set up the rest of your race. Um, so we talk a lot about what the conditions are, and for those of you who were with us last week, um, this will be just a little bit of a refresher, but um, you know we talk a lot about what kind of conditions there are. So if it's a puffy shifty day, the priority is to start in the most amount of pressure on the race course and start in phase. Um, if there's somewhere to race to, like the left has a lot more pressure because there's land over there, having a, a really clear lane or maybe starting towards that end of the line is, is a priority. Whereas if you have like a, an open race course and there's nothing really obvious, then you would um, maybe start um, with the bias or in a less trafficked area. Um, we talk a lot about the density of the starting line when we're approaching our start. Um, if there's a, the, a really big pin favor, but it's really packed, so it's really high density, then we'll maybe reconsider where to start. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of decisions that go into this and um, when in doubt, or you know, if there's nothing obvious or if it's an open race course, start in a place to be able to go straight and take the bias if you can. And I just want to add a quick side note there. Like, it's funny on the days that um, the, the breeze is steady and the line is square and that's not obvious which way we're going. It's kind of a funny, we're like, well, we're not really sure what to do. And you have to remember that like a lot of other people are thinking that and it's always a good plan to just have a good start with space to sail straight and do what you want. Um, yeah, so. Okay, but if the line is skewed, uh, I just want to talk about, we keep saying line bias, and sometimes people two people would say like line skew or whatever it might be, committee vote favored. But we're just talking about the moments that the wind is not exactly 90 degree perpendicular to the starting line, um, which I think you guys often sail on really shifty inland lakes, and that's probably like, it probably changes 10 times throughout the course of a sequence. Um, but we're basically asking ourselves, which is more upwind? Um, and, and how big is that bias? Because 
the shorter the starting line is, the less that line bias matters. The longer it is, the more difference it makes. So if you have a 100 bolt length line and five degrees of bias, that's really significant. Whereas if you have like a 10 bolt length line and five degrees of bias, um, it's not really enough to outweigh other factors that you're considering. So I'd like to ask a poll. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, a couple of notes about the line bias also is that uh, when it's really shifty, that bias is changing a lot throughout the sequence. Um, so being in tune with the shifts and how frequently they're changing will also kind of give you an indicator of like how late you need to make your game plan or how committed you need to be to it, right? So um, if it's changing a lot, then you might kind of hang back and go for a later approach. You might have like the no plan plan. Um, but if it's not changing a lot, then you can kind of rely on the bias. And if it hasn't shifted, then, you know, even, if you're start finishing through the same starting line, you can, it's that reliable if it's not very shifty. Um, so how do you check the, lie, the bias? So I wanna talk about that. Um, on our boat, we keep it really simple. We basically go to where we think is the middle of the line. We put the boat head to wind. Um, Steph checks the wind X at the top of the rig, make sure that's pointing into the wind. She keeps an eye on the jib, make sure that's in the boat end of the wind. And she'll tell me, mark, 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 when at the moments that the bow is like directly into the wind. Um, and that's a really big deal because if the bow's off by five or 10 degrees, then your line bias reading is all of a sudden pretty far off. So that's a kind of a skill that is really important. And to share one of her tricks in our boat, it's, it's pretty nice to like go backwards and, a lot, and then you at least have like flow over the rudder. Um, but I'll let her talk about that a little bit later. Um, but so basically going head to wind and then I stick my head between the chain plates, which is where the shroud's attached to the deck. Um, that's a really good like line between those two objects is definitely perpendicular to the center line of our boat, which should be in theory in line with the windex when we're head to wind. And so I look out from those two points and sometimes I'll put my arms out like this. You probably can't see cause I'm in a, <laughs> sorry, in a webinar. Um, you put your line, your, your imaginary arms out forever. And that line extends, um, through the chain plate. And if I'm looking up at the committee boat, if the committee boat's above that line, then we're committee boat favored. If the committee boat's below that line, then I check out the pin. Okay. So if the pin is above my you know, sight out through the port side of the boat and the pin's favored and vice versa. Um, yeah, I like to use those chain plates because it's like a really good reference point. Whereas if you just sit in the middle of the boat and stick your arms out, you have to be sure that like you are actually properly perpendicular to the boat and you want to do it in the same place every time. Um, so that's one really fancy, highly technical scientific way. You just look at 90 degrees from your boat and judge it based off that. Um, but there's another way that I'll let Steph talk about the compass because she's a numbers gal. <laughs> uh, yeah, can we go to the next slide? Yep. Cool. So we, yeah, like many said, we have a couple of different ways of doing this. Another way is to um, sail away from the committee boat end on starboard and um, line up your forestay with the pin end and then line up your rudder with the um, committee boat end of the starting line. So you can see um, on the right here, the boat is um, reaching away from the race committee boat. And as soon as they have things lined up, I'll say, mark, mark, mark. And then Maggie will give me a compass reading. And you can see here, our line is conveniently set, square, set to zero. So that means square to that starting line is 90 degrees. Um, we'll then sail down to the middle of the line. And one thing we'll do while we're on our way down to the middle of the line is just get a feel for what it feels like to be on the starting line and that as you get farther away from the ends that becomes harder and harder so having a good feel for what it feels like to be on the line is a really important part of our process so as we get down towards the middle of the line we'll go head to wind um, and like maggie said we'll use the windex or the jib flapping to give us an idea of where we are head to wind and maggie will take her quick shout readings um, and then we'll do our, our head our compass number as well so here, um, our head to wind was 85 degrees. So you can see here that we have a five degree pin favor. Um, and you know, something to think about is that, you know, being on lake sailing, the, the bias is constantly changing. So this is something really important to keep your eye on um, throughout the um, starting sequence. And I'm gonna let Steph elaborate on um, how the length of the line or the distance you are to objects affects the, the, uh, the amount of bias that you get. Yeah, so like Maggie said, like a lot of times we end up just eyeballing our, our, um, our bias. And here's just, an, here's just a chart um, from Speed and, Smart, Speed and Smarts where you can really um, 
visualize the penalty that you have for if you have a really long line and a big bias, um, the penalty for starting on the wrong side of the line is quite big. Um, and this also applies to shifts as well. So being on the wrong side of a shift or the wrong side of the line can be a really big penalty. Okay, so to simplify things, um, we like to divide the line into thirds. Uh, sometimes if you're racing in really big fleets, um, it's, you're racing the boats around you. You know, if there are like 30 boats on a line, for example, um, what matters is like the five or 10 boats nearest you. So we, now we kind of want to zoom in uh, to the small picture of like what third you're on. Um, and what type of data is really influences uh, your urgency to either be the boat that's closest to the committee boat or the boat that's closest to the pin versus saying we can be in the windward pack or I want to be on the hip of the boat of the pack that's at the pin. Um, and uh, you know, to, to take that to the next step. So say it's a really like steady day, kind of like the one that we showed you in the beginning that you had to win the left. There's a huge advantage to being the boat at the pin, right? Even the boat that's like um, on the hip of that boat and, and, and the hip of that boat and the hip of that boat, it's like, it's just inches and inches further away from the advantage that's being gained on the left. And so that kind of a day, it's really important to be the boat at the pin um, versus a day that it's like really shifty or puffy. Actually, you want options. So anywhere in that third, you know, you, you get the bias of the line um, by being in, in that third, you know, by being close to it. Uh, but you actually have more options by maybe setting up on the winner hip of that path. So anyhow, um, just to list a few pros and cons, basically the pin third, there's some risk associated with it because if you do have a bad start, say you drop main sheet or it's not your best acceleration, whatever happens, it happens. Um, your plan B is to tack away and you're further from clear air, which is out on that right side usually. So um, we say there's a little risk involved uh, being at the pin only because your, your exit option can be a little harder. You have to like sail through a lot of bad air before you break free to the clear air. Um, okay, and the middle third, we think the hardest part of the map, the middle third is gauging where you are on the line. We see the biggest um, line sag, which we'll get into in just one second, uh, in the middle, obviously. And, and where that sag is, can move, but generally speaking, like when you're closer to an end, it's just easier to see where the pin is and where that flag is at the committee boat, and therefore you're more accurate when you guess. Um, the boat third we kind of think about is like the safest place to start um, because your your option B to tack and get clear air if something goes wrong is generally easier, right? There's like less traffic, less clutter at the boat. Um, other other things I really like about being at the boat is timing. If your stopwatch is, you know, if you if you were really far away when the prep signal really went off. A lot of times you can hear the countdown, um, and uh, and when that's really like clear, it, it's kind of helpful. Also, sometimes when we're really pushing the line, uh, Steph will look at the PRO who's sighting the line, and she'll know where he or she is looking and who they're looking at and where they're gauging from, and uh, that can sometimes help you know how much you can push the line or how much you are pushing the line. So. Um, that's a tool too you can use at either end of the line is is really like if you're the pin most boat you can really like engage the eyes of um of the person calling the line at the pin and that's a really really good reference sweet um okay and then line sag this is just like it just happens all the time and we can't get rid of it we can't deny it we have to deal with it right it's um it happens a lot because people don't want to be over early and when you're in the middle of the line, you feel exposed. You can't see the eyes of the PRO on the, on the starting line. You can't see the pin boats anchor, you know? Um, and so you're a little like in this, what you feel like no man's land, you're exposed and you don't, you know, it, it's easy to make an error. You think that you're causing, you know, you're gonna, you're being risky and you're gonna pull the trigger early and be called over early because they must see you and you're sticking out. Um, but actually like there's a bit of an optical illusion that goes on when we line up bow to bow angle that we sit I mean, you know when we're head to wind those two boats would be bow to bow right and then when we turn down to the angle where we're sitting uh it, it all of a sudden actually like this angle feels like this feels like we're out and really protruding right but actually bow even feels like you're behind them so what i'm trying to say is that the angle you're sitting when you're down speed your references on where you are relative to other boats it gets kind of your perception skewed um, and in order to be bow out, you have to actually be quite forward on them. Like their bow might be at your mast in order to be bow to bow, as opposed to when you're sailing along, bow to bow would be more like that. Takeaway is that 
everyone starts setting up a little further back and a little further back. And so what is just bow out and feel safe on, you know, being just bow out on the boat to windward, everyone actually starts getting further and further back away until you get to the middle of the line where there's maximum amount of sag. Um, and so there's a huge opportunity here to jump the fleet and be bold and pull the trigger and know your time and distance and take advantage of that line sag. But you have to get really comfortable with um, knowing what is bow to bow, uh, what does that position look like and feel like relative to the line? And then what does it look like when you're sailing upwind? And is it, you know, you probably have to be a little further bow forward on the boat to windward to truly be at that 90 degrees uh, bow to bow line. Um, okay, so we have a couple tricks for, or Steph, you want to talk about your tricks for when you're in the line tag? Yeah, I think, you know, one thing that would, that makes me really nervous if we're in the middle of the line um, is if I can't see either end of the line. Um, that's, that's a big cue of like, I'm, I can't see either end. We need to, we need to start getting forward so we can at least take a peek of what's going on around us. Um, another trick, which is really handy for crews and sorry to any single handed sailors out there, um, is to, to put the boat head to wind and then just like in the pre-start when you check the line bias, the crew can put their arms out um, and get a feel for where both ends of the line are. Um, so, you know, if you have a really forward angle with your arms, you're obviously really far back, but as, as your arms get wider and wider, um, you're getting closer and closer to the line. Um, and I think we had a question um, from Richard Beers. Um, Hi, Richard. Hey, Richard. <laughs> Using a tactic type GPS equipment, when is it confusing to be staring at the GPS equipment near the start? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one because you certainly have to balance um, your feel versus what is, um, what's being relayed to you on the GPS. Um, I think it's really helpful for when you're setting, when you're initially setting up and you just kind of get a feel for how fast you're closing in on the line. Um, and then I think just like really knowing your acceleration time and knowing how long, how, what's the distance it takes to get the boat to full speed. So you can use that GPS as a reference. And if it's saying, you know, you're two boat lengths under, um, then you need to know how much time it's going to take you to accelerate and sail two boat lengths. So I think it's, I think it's a really good reference. Um, we don't use them, unfortunately, in our fleet. We're not allowed to use them. So um, it's all based off mine and Maggie's field. Yeah, and I think often with these instruments, you should be using it as a check, right? Like it should be um, someone's job on the boat, and ideally not the skippers, to be watching the meters, you know, closing under the line. Um, but the, like Steph said, the, the meters, the, you should be comparing the time left to the meters you have left to sail before you hit the line. And then that, that like closing speed, you know, can, can be pretty informative. But um, I wouldn't recommend just like blindly staring at the, the instruments and just starting based on that, you know, because uh, things change from the time you ping them. Yeah, we're going to start it off with a, with a poll question here to find out how many of you have a pre-start routine that you stick to. Basically, Maggie and I really believe in the power of prep um, for racing and we have a really big list of things we like to do before a day of racing and a, a little bit smaller of a list of things to do between races, but um, having a routine really helps you stay on task and helps, it helps with nerves um, and helps make sure you don't miss anything, especially on, you know, as the conditions change or the day goes on and you're starting to kind of mentally wear down a bit. So we really believe in the power of prep and we hope that with this presentation, we'll, we'll help you guys believe in it too. It's funny because I think this is like Steph's favorite part of the day. Like if we could launch three hours before start time and just go through the pre-start routine over and over and over again, I think she would. So we have about 75% of people say yes, they have a pre-start routine. Right. So that's, that's awesome. And, uh, you know, I hope that we can teach you guys something about what we do or you can share with us something that you do that's a little bit different. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, having your own routine, um, some people like to print them out, put them in their life jacket. I know for a while we did that um, and it just kind of helps you check things off the list. And it, it depends on what kind of sailor you, you are. If you're more laid back, like want to just feel things out, then a routine probably isn't for you. But for us, we really believe in this power of prep. Um, so there's a lot of things to do in order to feel ready. Um, this is kind of our list of things that we like to do from when we leave the beach to 
basically when the first warning signal goes up or the orange flag goes up at 10 minutes, um, we'll immediately get out to the race course um, and get into some upwind tuning. We'll get the rig and sails dialed in for the different conditions um, with Julia, and then she'll kind of split off and go check the current while we focus on um, doing some more tuning, some, bo some boat speed stuff. Um, if it's a steady day, we'll um, split with our, with our tuning partner. If it's a shifty, puffy day, we'll focus on transitions and, um, and some boat handling as well. Um, we'll, get, we'll get our compass numbers on each board. We'll maybe sometimes write them down, um, upwind and downwind. Uh, pre or boat handling, you can check the bias of the gate if that's set, um, and you can do a lot of practice accelerations. Um, one of my favorite things to do is to do accelerations between the gate marks if they're already set. So you can um, really practice using a line, and then you can check the bias at the same time. Killing two birds with one stone. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so accelerations are, we really, really practice those a lot. Like we try to get five or so accelerations before every race. Um, because they're such a critical part of, of the race. Um, we get a lot of head to winds. Um, we check the angle off the line. Sometimes we'll just um, come around the committee boat end. We'll come up on starboard close haul, check the angle, look under the boom. Okay, this looks like our, in a lifted angle. This confirms boat bias. Um, and you can kind of just circle around, keep, keep doing laps of the race committee boat. Um, you can also just spend time getting a feel for the line, like we said earlier, sail down the line on starboard and just get a feel for what it feels like to be there because it is, it's an invisible line. It feels weird. Um, and then you can practice using your line sight. Uh, you know, if you can get it at the line set early enough, get your line sight and then practice kind of creeping in using that line sight, um, counting down the time. Um, another big one, make sure the kite has no water in it and it was a clean takedown um, and check for weeds. So that's what we like. That's just a short list of things that we like to do. Just a couple <laughs> things to do. Yeah. Um, when I would actually like to emphasize that like a few things are absolutely non-negotiable, right? Like a few things we, if, if the starting gun goes off and we haven't done a couple accelerations, we'll do them. Um, because how many times of practice do you practice, or how many times of practice do you practice accelerations? And how many times has your first acceleration been your best of the day? Like, I'll answer that question, zero for me. Like my first acceleration is never ever the best. It's never usually even good, you know? I need to think about how much weight am I helping like rock and pump the boat? How much sheet, like where was the jib sheet going to? Um, how much weight are we applying out? You know, all of these things, like you don't wanna figure all those things out first race of the day. You know, you want to just do a few runs. And so that's like an absolutely essential one. If we're, if we're running low on time, we'll do a few of those after we get the time and then it's like, Okay, a couple practices. Um, and I also wanted to note, like, yeah, this seems like a pretty um, tedious, like, checklist of things. But when you do three or four or five races over the course of the day, like, mental fatigue is the real thing. Um, and it's, it's usually the last race of the day when everyone's, like, hungry and tired. And that's when you miss that the, there's been a 10 degree left shift or something. And had, had we done those compass line, you know, compass checks, like, we would have picked up on that. Um, and so, yeah, these things really help us uh, stay sharp and, like, help us catch the little things that nine times out of 10 you would, but then it's that 10th time that you're tired and, and maybe you wouldn't. Um, okay, so we keep throwing around line sight, so I just want to break that down a little bit. Um, there is a poll question, I believe. And I'm going to be honest, recently we did a self-assessment test of our um, world championships starting, well, we did a self-assessment of all the different skills involved, which was a pretty long Google form, but it was really helpful. Um, and one of the things was like, how good are you at line sites? And it was interesting because Steph and I answered it slightly differently. And the question was, you know, how good are you guys at getting line sites? And we can get line sites nine out of 10 times, you know, like we're, we're fairly good at using that. Um, but it was, if I think back to the number of races that I actually like use my line site, it, the number is much lower, you know, it's probably like 50 or 60% uh, on a good day. So um, that was just an area of improvement that we pointed out. And uh, I, I look forward to like getting back to training and working on that. But um, I would say that the accuracy that it allows you to have to have a good line site even if you get line sites 10 times and you use it like once when the, when the fleet doesn't know where the line is, like that's a huge gaining opportunity, you know? So 
Um, well, after this um, topic, we're going to break for some questions. So I'd love to hear more from you guys about like if it's a matter of difficulty getting transits or um, yeah, let me just lay out for you like how we do it. And then and I'd love to hear more about what, what your difficulties are. Um, okay, so we will always get a line site on the line and our online line site is always through the flag on the committee boat. And that's important because if your committee boat's 20 feet long and the orange flag is on the bow versus the stern, like that's gonna have a big impact on your line site. So you gotta make sure that where you're getting your starting line, line site from on the boat is really where they're sighting the line. Okay, so we've got that orange flag and then you go through the pin to something on shore. And um, we've got some really fancy word art here for you. Sorry, <laughs> these graphics are so awesome. Uh, there's a water tower on shore that is our online transit in this, uh, in this diagram. Okay, and then the other two areas we like to get line sites are, it's either like two bull lengths under or like four bull lengths under. And that changes based on the conditions. Um, in our boat, in a 49er, when it's really windy, we like to set up four to three or four bull lengths under the line and get a lot of flow and accelerate and hit the line at full speed after traveling a few bull lengths. Um, and that is different than a light air start where everyone will like sit on the line completely stopped, you know, within one to two bolt lengths of the line, um, not move forwards or backwards or anything, just hold that spot for like three or four minutes sometimes, and then put the bow down and accelerate. Um, and so in one case scenario, we're really close to the line the whole time. And so that will be, you know, in the lighter, it's important for me to have like a one or two under line sight uh, to shore. And when it's windy, it's more important to have that like four bolt length under benchmark um, further under the line. And then, you know, if you do happen to have three transits on shore, it's really helpful to watch how, how quickly you're closing in on the line based on how soon those transits are coming up. Steph, is this, uh, is that all kind of making sense? Are there any questions sure. in the chat specifically about that yeah. stuff? Yeah, we do. So I, and I just wanted to add one thing is, one thing you can add to your pre-start routine, and just like Maggie said, it is seeing how quickly you close in on those line sites. We'll often take runs at the line, we'll, we'll go down you know, a couple boat lengths away from the line, tack onto starboard, and then um, and then sail close haul to the line and, and look at our line sites and see how quickly we're closing in on them just so we can get a, a better gauge for time and distance. Um, and then Luke Johnson just asked, um, what are our tips for judging distance when you're on an offshore course and there are no land references for line sites? I'm laughing because it's, uh, yeah, it's impossible. You obviously can't get any line sites and those are definitely the hardest days. Um, you know, you might, you might consider um, just starting at an end on that day because you don't know where the line is. And if, if you're on an offshore course, you might not have any huge shifts going on. So you don't really need to, you know, be at one end of the line or the other. So you can just take an end and, and focus on speed off the end of the line. Um, the other thing is we, we do work really hard. So, um, Okay, sorry, Luke, one, one other option is to cite everything but in the opposite direction. So citing from the pin over the committee boat. Um, and that's, that takes a little practice to get used to looking the opposite way uh, and, and getting, you know, using that as a reference. But it is an option to have a committee boat uh, line site going in the opposite direction. Um, if there is nothing on shore or nothing good, or maybe, you know, you can't see anything, um, we will ask Julia, our coach, um, if this is an option for you to go to lure to the line and sight from the pin to the boat. And basically we'll do runs up the line, you know, we'll do runs up the starting line and um, either I'll raise my hand when I think we're on the line and I hope she raises her hand at the same time, you know, <laughs> um, and then she'll raise her hand when we do cross the line. And that just helps me calibrate like, okay, I don't have any references on shore, but um, you become familiar with like the distance of the line and where you are and kind of, what it feels like and, and what the committee boat looks like at that point. One other thing you can do too is um, if you, for example, like start at the boat end and reach down and to the middle of the line, then you can go head to wind and back down from there. So you can kind of reference, okay, I'm backing down two boat lengths from there and then plot your position from there. Um, that's another way to do it. So it's definitely, it's, it's so hard when you don't have line, when you don't have land on either side, that's it really throws a wrench into, into plans. Yeah. Um, um, and we've learned also though that like, it's important to know who you're starting against and how frequent OCSs are in your fleet. Um, because there are days that 
we've all had these days when you get off the water and you're like, oh my gosh, that boat was definitely over. That whole pack must have been over. And then they weren't, you know, and um, that should kind of make you question your judgment, you know, and, and wonder if they have a better sense of where the line is, or maybe they did on that day, but just know that like, know the behavior of your fleet um, and how frequent OCSs are, because if they're very infrequent and you're the only one that thinks everyone else is over, then you might reconsider. <laughs> What's that? Reconsider how you approach it. Yes, that's a good way to put it. Exactly. So we um, thought this would be a good point to kind of pause for questions and see if um, anything didn't make sense or if someone wants to, if you need to get up and refill your glass of water or whatever it might be. Uh, Go to the bathroom. We'll just take a one minute break for questions and bathroom break here. Al here. If the shore is is close, your line site will be different depending on where you are, boat end, middle, pin end. How do you deal with that? Al, oh, I appreciate you bringing that up. It's a really good point. Um, and what we what I like to do is get line sites from where we anticipate starting. And so if we want to start at the committee boat, I like to get line sites there. If we want to, if I think we're likely starting in the middle, I'll have us run that a few times. Um, your online line site shouldn't change. Uh, at all and and but your your two boat lengths under line site in the middle of the line will be one boat length under and at the pin um it might be useless uh so it depends on how big the line is and how close the shoreline is um but basically i i think it's good to get your line site and then run the line and check your transits where you anticipate starting we have a another question here from richard beers um, so at the start of the season, it's a good practice to get the crew into a routine of all those activities. Then it becomes second nature. Definitely. Um, you can't, you can't practice accelerations or line sites enough. Um, they're really, really important. Um, and then Todd Wilson asks, what drills are your favorite for practicing starts both by yourself or with training partners? Um, you mentioned the hand raising one, which is really good. We have a million drills. <laughs> that um, actually we have a slide later on that we uh, mention it if we have time. Yeah. Um, but thanks for bringing that up. Do you, maybe we can hold that until a little bit later. Yeah, we can do that later. Um, and then from Phil, how much time do you spend checking overlaps with other boats versus timer, wind, et cetera? Um, and that's, I think that's specifically for, we're gonna get into that actually in this next part. Um, uh, where we'll kind of divide, we'll talk about our, our um, division of roles and what we're each looking at um, as we get further into the sequence. So I think that's a good segue into our next topic. Sweet. Cool. So like we talked about earlier, we like to have this routine of things that we like to do from the moment we leave the beach until the orange flags go up or the five minute flags go up, however your sequence works. Um, and this is kind of our routine of um, a way that we like to approach racing. Um, so five minutes, we like to be at the race committee boat where it's really easy to get the time because you're right next to the person doing the countdown. Um, you can check the course and the compass heading, then you can bear away or sorry, then you can go head to win, kind of back up, check your transit, go forward and back and forward and back. Sometimes that's a little bit traffic dependent. Um, and then we like to make our final rig call um, because we have to have that dialed in before four minutes. Um, and then at four minutes, um, we check which prep flag went up. We check the angle of the line. So we'll kind of just hang out near the starboard end. We'll bear away, um, send it down the line towards the middle. We'll check the angle of the line there and then we'll go head to wind again. Um, from there, um, around three minutes, we'll just spend time hanging out above the line, looking up when, discussing the game plan, reminder of the priorities, um, those things that we discussed last week. Um, and then at two minutes, um, we'll do our final game plan call and we'll split to a side. So I, we like being in the middle because if you say, okay, we really like the right, you can split off to the boat end pretty easily. If you like the left, you can split off to the pin end pretty easily. And that timing of that game plan might happen a little bit sooner. Let's say it's light air. We'd probably err on the side of being in our spot around three minutes or four minutes. So we need to know the game plan sooner. But if it's a really puffy, shifty day, we're not going to make that final game plan call until two minutes. Um, and then one minute, we kind of started making our final approach to the line. Um, we start dialing into the boats around us, um, our distance to the line, and then and our setup on the boats around us. Um, and we kind of have this time as like a 
a final bailout time. Um, so one minute comes around and we're not liking the spot that we're in for whatever reason, um, we'll say, okay, it's, it's time to start looking for a bailout. Um, because that's the amount of time we believe it takes to do a, a circle and get back to finding a good hole on the line. Um, at 30 seconds, our attention kind of goes to where is our bow um, in relation to other boats? Are we, are we bow out on boats? Are we bow behind on boats? Um, and how is our gap to lure? Do we have a good gap to lure or um, are we going to be struggling with that gap? Um, and then 20 seconds, focusing on the pressure for the start. Um, so Maggie's kind of looking towards both sides of the line and I'm kind of looking forward. So I'm, I make a call on what pressure we're going to have. And then that affects our acceleration. If it's a really steady day, probably don't need to make a call, but if it's a really puffy shifty day, then we'll make a call like pressures up for this acceleration or, you know, we're going to have a really light acceleration here. Um, and then Maggie goes controls on around 20 seconds. Um, and then we really start managing the flow um, based on our time and distance and when, where our bow is to other boats. So, if we're really early, we're starting to have a little bit less, we want a little bit less flow forward. If we're, if we're late, we're starting to really pick up the pace and, and pick up the flow in the boat. Um, and then that's also kind of our earmark time for a final double tack. So something that's fun about our, our fleet is we do a lot of double tacking to position ourselves um, really strong on the boats around us. So um, 20 seconds is kind of like the final time that you can really make that, that double tack up to the windward boat. Um, and that all somehow happens in five seconds, according to my list. Um, but at 15 seconds, we start talking about our, our acceleration time. And that's, Maggie really leads the charge on that based on um, the, the distance that she's seeing. Um, but I'll also chime in based on the amount of flow that we have. If we don't have a lot of flow, but we have um, a lot of time to the line, like then we really need to, that acceleration time needs to happen sooner. Um, and then we, from there, we just, we get into our preload phase, which is just kind of tensioning, putting tension on the leeches of the sails and just starting to get the sails drawing some more. Um, and then we execute the acceleration. So kind of just breaking it up on how we think about different parts of the start and, um, you know, just in 10 seconds, a lot can change. So I think it's, it's kind of fun to write this out and what your focus is, is based on what your job is on the boat. And I think if there were, if we had like a graphic overlaid on this, this flow chart of all the times, you'd see that like we go from big picture, we're looking at the race course from like five minutes to three minutes, you're still in the like gathering information phase, thinking about your game plan, what you're going to do, what's changing, what's happening. And then really after like a minute, our focus is totally on the boats around us. Like we're not necessarily locked in, but at that point in terms of like we couldn't bail if things were bad. Um, but the focus is really on boat positioning, you know, so it shifts from like up the course to like just the boats around us because that's who we're racing at that time. And not a whole lot matters. Um, what Steph was talking about, the pressure for the start, like that's usually velocity or if there's a big angle change and that is, um, that affects our acceleration time. But she wasn't talking about that in terms of like changing our game plan necessarily. Um, because yeah, full focus just on that positioning uh, from that point on. And Steph, I think we also had a lot of success like in the last year and a half, we, we focused a lot on our starting. Um, and when we broke everything down into a really clear division of labor, you know, um, I do the, st the timers uh, or the timing. And so like how I say the time every time has to be consistent and should be consistent. Um, in terms of like time and distance, that's like on my plate, uh, game plan is steps and on the puffy shifty crazy days, like I'll have, um, additional like timing check-ins where I'll ask like, prompting questions to like check in with stuff like still the same game plan do you still like the right are you still thinking we're going right um and so that's the only other thing I, I would add to this list which is very comprehensive <laughs> yeah and just real quick we have a couple of questions in the chat um from al hager in a single-handed boat it's important to get an on the line site from the skipper's position and i totally agree with that it's yeah you don't have someone closer to the bow and actually that's an advantage we have with with Maggie being the crew is if it's light enough she can she can go to the bow of the boat and kind of check in on um, where the line is and that's something you could do in a double handed boat but certainly in a single handed boat you have to kind of gauge a bit more like when you do your transit where the bow is and then where yeah where you're you need to gauge it from where you're sitting from for sure um, and then Richard was asking us to comment on um, preparation practices with three to seven person crews. Um, I think we're going to save that one for after our chat. 
And then we also got a couple questions about managing flow and preloading and accelerations. Um, we're gonna get into some more of that in a little bit. So we'll keep going here. And then if you guys still have further questions um, after those, we'll, we'll take them. A couple of different ways for your, your final approach. Um, you, what we consider final approach is like that two or three minute period of when you split after you've made your final game plan. Um, for us, like I said, we like to be in the middle of the line and then split to whatever end of the line we're going to. Some people like to keep it really loose and kind of just wing it and have freestyle. Um, other people like to have a timed loop. Um, so this is an example of something that Steve Hunt um, taught me when I was racing with him. And it's just a nice way to keep things really consistent and have a routine. So if you, if you think about where you want to start, you go to that place and you're there on starboard at three minutes. So in this example, this boat wants to start in the middle. They're on starboard at three minutes and then they reach out um, away from the line on starboard, drive around at two minutes, come back and then plant their tack at one minute to go. Um, and a couple of things that are important for any time you do this time loop or port tack approach, um, you need to think about um, that, how that tacking point is affected by different things. So um, bias and shift. If you have a left shift or a pin end bias, that tacking point needs to be closer to the line because it's really hard to gain distance to the line in a left shift or pin bias. Whereas vice versa, if you have a boat end bias or if you have a right shift, it's really easy to close that distance to the line. So you might um, back up that tacking point a little bit. And then, you know, other things like current um, would affect it or the breeze. So if you have um, a really lighter start, like Maggie said earlier, you, you'd have, you'd be in general a little bit closer to the line. Whereas in heavier, you'd be a bit farther back. So just some things to continue, consider as you're making that final approach to the line. Um, going forward into once you've made that tack onto starboard and you're starting that final, final approach to the line, um, all your energy needs to go into managing the boats around you. And this is actually like one of my favorite parts of the start um, is making this, this gap and it's, Controlling the boat to windward of you um, and mismatching what the boat to leeward of you is doing um, and then managing your flow. And we did have a couple of questions on that. So flow is to us is basically water moving over the foils. It's a, when you have flow, the boat reacts to whatever you do with the helm. There's times when you have like no flow and the boat is completely stalled and you have that feeling when you're pushing or pulling the rudder and like nothing's happening or the boat just keeps sliding sideways. Um, and in our boat, it's, it's really important that you have flow um, either forwards or backwards flow all throughout the starting sequence because as soon as we lose flow, the boat just becomes really, really hard to sail and kind of gets out of control, especially in breeze. Um, so just kind of some, some things to think about um, with managing your hole. Um, if you, have your, if you have good flow, you're going to be able to gain control of the boats around you. Um, and again, if you know, you're, you're looking at this lured boat and trying to gain a gap to lured of you, and you're trying to, to mismatch what they're doing, and then you're looking to the windward boat and trying to match what they're doing. So in our fleet, like I said, there's a lot of double tacking going on. There's a lot of crabbing, a lot of sliding. And so um, we're constantly looking to try to close that gap to the boat to windward and make that gap um, on the lured boat. I think one thing to um, add on to that is that if you do lose flow, that you have to be patient in gaining it back. Like there's nothing worse than like if you, you lose the flow and then you start pulling your sails on really tight and then like your boat just keeps going sideways. Um, we have a term on our boat for when that happens. We call it burping the sails. Um, so we'll kind of just slowly like give a couple pumps on the main, a couple pumps on the jib, and that'll like slowly reattach the flow. And you can also like um, rock the boat to leeward and, and press it to reattach flow that way. Um, and then another fun part about this whole battle is uh, snatching and defending um, your hole on the starting line. So a little bit of a crazy drawing here, but um, just kind of want to break it down into two modes, um, offense or defense. If you're boat A, boat C, boat D, boat F, or boat G, you're on defense. You have a good, um, you have a good hole. You, you like where you're at, you're on defense. Mainly any boat on starboard here. 
Um, and then both B, E, and H are all on offense. They're still trying to find their, their position on the starting line. So just a couple of strategies for when you're on defense. Um, your eyes need to be constantly looking around. If, we're, if we have a good spot and I really like where we're at, I'm looking to windward. I'm looking behind us. I'm looking to leeward of us. And Maggie's doing the same thing. She's looking forward to the line site. She's looking sideways. She's looking back. Um, we're basically doing everything we can to protect what we have. Um, and one thing that we really like to do, especially in light air, is um, talk about taking up space. So as boat A, for example, if you know you have a nice gap to leeward and you see boat B is trying to, to shark in there, then you can kind of like go to like half the halfway point in your hole, let your sails out, just take up a lot of room so they're not tempted to go in there. Um, yeah, oftentimes like, and I, I'm in charge of seeing the sharks on our boat. Um, if we are A and things are looking really good and our hole's really big, we're vulnerable, right? So I'll be like, Steph, a shark is coming. Um, she'll do a big downturn, big upturn, and just take up as much space as possible and make that hole less appealing. And oftentimes they'll head back up and bail. Um, yeah, so it's, either, it's yeah. just a matter of like, are we on offense? Are we on defense? And the crews can really help play, you know, be the other set of eyes. Because one way that Steph skulls and trims the main sheet, she actually can't see directly behind her. Um, and, and so that, that like zone, her blind spot is my, my responsibility, so. I just have to remember, I'm on shark patrol. <laughs> shark patrol, yeah. And then if you're on offense, um, there's a couple of sneaky ways to uh, to try to, to take that that hole. Um, and just kind of talking out loud here, B, boat B, um, their whole goal is to catch A while they're not looking. So if the skipper or the crew are maybe focused forward on something, you can kind of get your speed up quickly and then try to overlap them and, and take that hole. Um, if you're boat E, um, one technique is to actually like continue, continue sailing beyond D, like you're going to keep going, but as soon as D puts their bow up, you can tack in and take their spot. Um, and then boat H, um, who's trying to just tack underneath, underneath boat G, obviously boat G is really close to the starting line and they're maybe a little bit thin on the pin. So boat H knows that it would be pretty high risk for boat G to put their bow down and gain speed because they would A go forward and maybe not make the pin that pin late line. So just kind of a little bit of, of strategy there, um, different options for when you're trying to, to take a hole on, on that port tack approach. All right, so <laughs> this is, uh, Maggie and I had some fun making this slide. <laughs> so we took our boats that are all lined up on the starting line now and just and we just want to show you the difference in thought that you might have at 45 seconds and then the next slide will show you at 20 seconds um, maybe some differences in thought you might have based on what boat you are um, so going back to 45 seconds um, yeah so obviously boat H is really thin on ley line and they're trying to think like can I make this what's my distance to the line am I going to be able to make the pin boat G thinking about if boat H is making it, and then they're also thinking about time and distance and managing that flow. Um, boat F is thinking, I need some space to loop. Can I, can I tack twice um, and steal boat E's hole? Um, boat E is thinking, I can't see anything. I need, you know, I can't see either end. I need to sail forward and get, you know, maybe more bow even with boat D. Boat D knows they're um, really close to the starting line and they're gonna have a, a, a late trigger pull. Um, boat C is in a tough spot, really thin on someone's hip and no gap to leeward um, and quite crowded up near the boat. So they're thinking they need to bail and what are their options? And this is actually, I think, a really important point to touch base on is what are your options when you need to bail out? Um, and it, it kind of depends on where you are on the line. Um, if you're further down the line, it's a little bit easier because I think it's important to jive around and to sail against the grain. Um, and then find your find your next spot. Um, and that's something like Maggie will help me manage as well. She'll she'll be looking around. If she knows we're getting maybe getting into trouble, she'll look around and say, oh, there's there's a hole above boat F or there's something below boat D. And she'll she'll help me um, make that bailout call. The other option is just um, to start on port. Um, if you're boat G and you you don't like how this is going, or your boat H, you don't like how it's going, just bear away tack onto port, and then rabbit start everyone. Um, and I want to point out as the crew, there are ways that you can use communication to like 
help uh, improve confidence and offer options and be problem solving and proactive. And then there are ways that like you can just make the situation so much worse, right? So we've, uh, Steph has never done this before, but say, imagine we're in boat H, right? And we're not making the pin and it's like obvious to us crews, right? We're like, oh gosh, this is not getting any better. Instead of being like, we're totally not making that ley line, how we're totally not making that ley line. Uh, you can say things like, what are our options? Like, how about starting on port? Or, um, you know, could we tack and make the committee boat? Or I think we have, we do have time to go find another hole. You know, offering potential options instead of just identifying how bad the situation is, is helpful and helps be proactive and forward thinking. So just wanted to point that out that we crews have some power <laughs> in this situation. Um, and yeah, and then just, again, some thoughts at 20 seconds. Um, I think the biggest difference in thoughts is um, boats A and B. I think boat B is just really thinking about how can I keep control of boat A and manage manage that gap to windward um, and keep creating that gap to leeward so I can have a really good acceleration. Um, and just, it's kind of fun to just map out where everyone can be at different parts in the start um, and what what might be going through your head based on, on the, where you're at. Cool. Um, I just wanted to make uh, a couple points about the actual acceleration because every boat is really different. And um, one piece of homework you really need to do is to understand how long it takes your boat to go from dead stop to full speed in all the different wave states and the different conditions. Um, and that's kind of like a, a default answer to, um, we learned like, okay, it takes a minimum of seven seconds when we're dead stop to go bow down and to get up to full speed. And during that time, we only travel like a boat length and a half, you know, um, a surprisingly short amount. And so we just have that in our back pocket of knowing like, even if we think we're close to the line, you know, even if we think we're within a couple of lengths, like we have to be going forward at seven seconds or 10 seconds or 12 seconds in different breeze strengths. Um, and so that's a bit of homework that you can do on your own. Uh, you can just put your bow next to a buoy and measure how far you go and what's like the, the, the latest you could pull the trigger and be moving forward at the gun. Um, and so key to really having good and accurate accelerations is understanding your, your time and distance um, and the communication. So on our boat, I talk about boat lengths under the line and boat lengths to the line. Um, and that can be slightly different based on the wind shifts like Steph was talking earlier. So we might be one boat length under, but in a big left shift, it might be three lengths to the line or two lengths to the line. Um, or vice versa, in a right shift, we might be one boat length under, but only uh, close, you know, one boat length under, but one, one boat length uh, traveling once we once we trim sails and go. So um, just understanding like the time and distance and, and how you communicate that to your skipper or crew is, is, is really helpful. Um, we have a couple different kinds of acceleration. So like we were talking earlier about um, when it's windy, we'll just trim sails and basically like go slow and then go fast, <laughs> you know, and that's like a flow acceleration. I might be like, Steph might say, we're gonna get flow and then go. Um, and then a pivot would be um, when we're really close to the, wind, the line in really light air and we literally pivot our bow down, trim sails and go with a big rock and pump. Um, and so we name those just so we're on the same page and um, they require slightly different steps from each of us, but it allows us to at least kind of uh, have a process. Um, and then also another piece of homework you can do that is pretty relevant for your acceleration is knowing how long a bailout takes, you know, that like, jibe around that Steph was talking about in light air, it might be 10 seconds and in heavier, it might, well, it might be 20 seconds in lighter and 10 seconds in heavier. Um, but knowing the amount of time it takes you to do that maneuver and then how long you have to sail to the committee boat tells you what's the latest time I can bail out of it a hole if it's not looking good. Yeah, just, and something to add to that um, is just another advantage of doing your pre-start accelerations between the gates is that if you just stop next to the, put your bow next to the mark, and you just start a watch and just do an acceleration, a couple of accelerations next to the mark, then you can see how long it takes you to do that acceleration. And then, so see the time and then also see the distance and how long it takes you to do the acceleration. Yeah, totally. Um, okay, and then all of everything we've just talked about, you know, making a game plan, figuring out the line bias, managing your hole and all of that, none of it matters if you can't sail fast right after the start, right? So. That is a skill in itself that, in our opinion, was like more than 50% of like our starting ability. You know, like if you can't lock in immediately after the start, then it doesn't matter how you start. <laughs> so um, being able to lock in for us means are we able to hike 100%, you know, or are we like fidgeting around with our toggling, you know, our trapeze lines, or am I fidgeting around with the controls? Um, do we know 
where the jib sheet is getting sheeted to because we have a mark on the jib sheet and a marking system and um, you know we don't want to be adjusting that so basically just knowing that we can like fully lock in right after the start and being able to kind of get everything to it their marks for those brief strengths and then focus on nothing but speed and that lane management right at the start is really critical um, we do a lot of drills that is like a two minute drill basically you start and sail for two minutes straight and, and the focus is only on locking in and focusing on your lane management for those two minutes and that's all that matters um and and so we'll tell you more about drills in a second but um those are all a little pieces of like uh homework that you can gather beforehand where's my van going to be where's my cunningham going to be where how much am i hiking in this restraint it's all really important um and we want to talk a little bit also about the mentality because that's a really big part of starting it's the mo it's a moment where a lot of people tell us I get so nervous before the gun goes off, you know, or I get, I get so nervous and I feel, I feel my heart pounding in that last minute for the start. And like, we've totally been there. If you didn't ever feel nervous, that probably means you don't care about sailing. And so being a little nervous is okay. Um, but the fear of being over or the fear of screwing up can really um, have a more detrimental effect on your race than an occasional OCS. Uh, and so I just want to talk a little bit about a few ways to like manage that, um, that sort of anxiety. Um, first of all, knowing your fleet and how frequent the OCSs are actually, you know, given is, is a helpful way to reassure yourself that like the fleet that is or is not pushing the line a lot. Uh, and, and so that can just help give you a little bit more confidence and help, um, remind you that when you think people are over, they, they most of the time are not. Um, we like to know who are the repeat offenders and what condition do they do it in, you know, so we can tell you which teams when it's windy are over frequently or which teams when it's light are over frequently. Um, and that does help when I, I think, okay, I think they're over. And then I know that they've also had three OCSs this year. So, you know, that's, it's kind of, you're doing like some, uh, research on your opposition research. Um, but I also want to reiterate that like communication can really influence the confidence levels on the boat. And so from the crews, like it's my, it's my responsibility to manage time and distance. If I say something like, Steph, I don't know where the line is, don't be over, you know, <laughs> that just totally puts her on her back foot. You know, that is like not a way to help uh, anyone accomplish anything. That just makes her feel like all she can do is screw up. Um, but if I say, uh, can't see my line sights, we're going off bows. You know, that's a really diff I'm communicating the same thing. I'm saying, I don't know where the line is, you know, but it's in a way that's forward thinking, it's proactive and it's saying, we're going to go off the bows and we're all either all going to be over together or we're all going to be okay together, but we'll have a good start. Um, Steph, did you want to add anything else to mentality before we get into like scoring starts and stuff? Yeah, I think, you know, another part of the mentality and I think it's really important for skippers is just to really, really be aggressive and just like really own it. And I think I said that in our last chat about owning your game plan and you just, you have to own your, own your start too, and really, really aim to take control. And it's almost like, you know, when that one minute gun goes, it's like, it's all on from there. And you really just, you put all of your energy into making the best start that you can. And, um, yeah, I think a lot of it just comes from being aggressive and, and having good boat handling and, and trusting your boat handling and, and all your, your training up until that point. Yeah, and one thing that helped me is when we started talking about those last 30 seconds, like the concept of being brave and trusting yourself and trusting that your transits were good and trusting that your time and distance is good. And, and you can you get to that point when you feel like you've practiced it a lot, but then to take that next leap out of regatta and actually trust it all and, and, in, in, and uh, implement it, you kind of have to be brave at a certain point. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that if you are gun shy at the start and you tend to start in second or third row starts, um, you're always going to be questioning your boat speed and your tactics. It's so easy to finish a race that went badly uh, because you had a bad start and say, well, I was slow, but were you really slow or did you have bad lanes, you know, because you had a bad start or uh, I couldn't catch a single shift. And the question you need to ask yourself if you're not starting well is like, were you not, catch were you not, getting a single shift or were you not able to make choices and capitalize on shifts because your decisions were dictated by where all the other boats are. And um, so we learned that like uh, taking a little more risk and getting an occasional OCS was actually uh, better than being really um, risk averse and being under the line at all the starts. You're just, just giving up boat lengths, you know, to, if you're, if you're consistently starting under the line that you would not give up anywhere else around the race course, you know, <laughs> Um, okay, so 
also our like little journey through starting and the progression of that. Um, we, if you haven't told, if you can't tell yet, we're like a num we like the data. Uh, Steph is a numbers gal and she likes scores and, and hard facts. And so um, we started to have Julia rate us one through five on execution of the start. And that really came down to just a general execution score of like, could we do what we wanted to do, which was either sail straight and maintain that lane or tack when we wanted to. Um, were we on the line when the gun went off or were we three bolt lengths back? And were we at full speed and able to hike and lock into our, our full speed mode and not be fidgeting and was the sail setup good and could the boat just rip? And so over time, it was kind of cool to track the fact that our scores did in fact go up. And uh, at, at one point in January of 2018, we were executing at such a, at such a low rate. They were like, our average was way under 2% of the time, I'm sorry, two out of five of the time. So um, that was nice to see a little upward trend there. <laughs> um, <laughs> But you can also, um, sorry, going back to this for a second, this is something that we practice on our own a lot. Um, when we're sailing alone, we can kind of race ourselves by uh, doing like 15 starts over and over again. And it's a little competition within our group. Like when we actually get a, a five, it's like we're really excited. <laughs> and it's just a way to kind of set the, the uh, expectations for the practice. One thing we did want to get, a, we have one more poll to send out, and this is for a future reference um, because we will have a rules chat down the road. And we just wanted to ask you guys how comfortable you are with the pre-start rules. Um, so there is uh, one drill we really like is um, setting up two starting lines. One is a starting line that we'll call the real starting line, upwind. And then one is two bolt lengths below that. And you have to designate which starting line. So say you'll have to be below the, the lured starting line until 30 seconds. And then after 30 seconds, you're allowed to cross over, but you can't be over early on the next one. Um, and that really helped us gauge how far we actually travel at the down speed rate. And uh, it helped us calibrate our closing distance to the line and feel comfortable that actually it takes quite a long time traveling at a down speed rate to go to bolt lengths. And so that, that's a really good one. And you can change the timing parameters based on the wind speed, but um, having two starting lines, one upwind and one downwind, and then um, challenging yourself to either stay below or like kill that amount of time without tacking once you've crossed that downwind one is, is was really helpful. Um, I told you guys earlier about the two minute drills. So that's when you start and the full focus is on not, you know, not tacking and just managing your lane and your speed as best as possible for two minutes. Um, and I think there's an intensity that lane management requires that um, is hard. You can't really do that for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, and so you, you're practicing directing all of your energy into locking in as fast as you can and sailing the boat as well as you can for those first two really critical minutes. Um, and then after two minutes, you tack and then you sail for another two minutes. And then, and, and Steph, remind me, uh, and then you tack set basically. Um, yeah. And, and that we love that drill and it really helps simulate locking in after the start. Yeah, it's a fun drill to do when you just have two boats because um, boats come off the line and you don't, you're not trying to attack each other on the line. You give each other some space. You just focus on executing the start and then you'll see after two minutes who, who has the advantage and you'll see, oh, maybe the windward boat rolls or the lured boat gets an advantage. And then when you tack, you'll really, really see that advantage because one boat is, is totally in control of the other. Yeah, um, and the other one that is very repetitive, but very effective, and this would be a day that we do like score ourselves or, and, or have Julia kind of score and keep track of it. We'll go out and do five starts at the boat, five starts in the middle, five starts at the pin, five starts on port. Um, and we'll just do it over and over and over again. Uh, and, and the repetitions really help um, hone in like the, the little changes in the speed, um, the wind speed and how that affects the acceleration or the shifts and how that expect that affects the acceleration timing. Um, but that's, that's a great drill that we like to do on our own and you just need two marks and a timer and you can just go do that. Yeah. Yeah. And then one more is, um, it's called around, around the mark. Um, or you can just do it with your, your bow on the mark. Um, given the boat handling that we do, we'll, um, we'll go around the mark without tacking basically where we have to, come up next to the mark, slide sideways, back down, and then go forward again. 
um, and basically do a circle around the mark. But another good one is just to have a mark set and then hold your bow um, close as close to the mark as you can. And then that really helps you practice getting forward flow, getting backward flow, holding your spot. Um, that's, a, that's a really good one, really fun one. Can be very frustrating at first. <laughs> Um, yeah, so those are just some of our, the fun drills that we like to do, and we're, we're happy to, to talk with people more about um, some other drills that we do, um, and we're happy to open it up again to any more questions anyone might have. Um, one from Justin, um, on a long starting line, do you gravitate more to the middle of the line in light air to take less risk and start closer to an end and heavier knowing that shifts are not as big? Any thoughts, Maggie? <laughs> yeah, I would actually say um, it's a really good point. In light air, um, we actually like to start on the edge. Uh, and the bigger the fleet gets, the more important this is, I think. Um, in light air, if it's like a 100 boat line laser starting line, you know, uh, you will find that there's a little more wind down the edges. Um, and, and it's you're closer to clear air. And so I would gravitate to, towards the, the sides, actually, in the lighter air. Um, I'm interested now, Steph, do you agree? <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay. <laughs> um, starting on the edges. Yeah. I would say like our, yeah, I think lighters are the only time that we really consider like where we start. It's like helps take priority, like getting out to an edge is so, so important, having a fat lane um, upwind that you, you want to put yourself maybe on an edge to make that happen. Yeah. Um, and then Richard asked when we're doing those drills, which are with another training partner and which are alone. I was just thinking we can actually, we'll send out a list of all the drills that we think you can do um, on your own or with a training partner. So, cause I know you guys are all hopefully getting on the water soon and we can, we can send out some ideas for all of you guys to do some training um, before you start racing this summer. I think we've actually done almost all of those drills alone and with a training partner. Yeah. Cool, and then we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, how does your risk management strategy differ in blue flag versus view flag versus black flag starts? Um, and actually for us, we, we only ever start with a U flag or black flag typically. Um, in a metal race, we'll start sometimes with a blue flag, with a prep flag, mm -hmm. um, but we usually have a U flag. And, yeah, there is definitely some some risk management that goes along with it, and I think thinking about like what you're do you have a a discard race or have you already sailed that race? Like if you've already sailed your throw out, you might want to err on starting more towards the end where you can judge the line a little bit better. Whereas if you don't have that throw out, you can take a bit more risk on your start. Um, so I think I'd we'd think about it um, in that sense if you already have your throw out or not. Um, Maggie, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, and I used to think, okay, it's black flag or U flag, like we can't be over or we're going to ruin our regatta. Um, and I realized that actually you ruin your regatta by starting like third row every time. Um, and so the risk was almost higher to like to not start well. Um, and so I don't like to think about if it's a black flag or U flag or a Ford and qualifying or if we have a throwout or not, because that, that seemed to make me be more conservative and, and to like um, communicate in a way that would make Steph feel like inhibited. You know, I'd be like, okay, we can't be over, we can't be over. Um, but what I learned is black flags and U flags are a really great opportunity to have a good start and let people be scared <laughs> and let people be, be pretty far bow back. Um, so if you think about it as, okay, black flags up, people are going to be really gun shy. Uh, I think that helps you mentally frame it as like, it doesn't mean we're going to be the first to pull the trigger and we're going to start in the middle of the line and start blind without a transit, you know, but it does mean we're going to use our normal systems and we're going to expect people to be timid and hesitant and uh, hold back. Um, and that, that certainly helped me to reframe it as like, so we, this is an opportunity that people are scared, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, don't allow yourself to, um, you know, don't change your systems. It's not that we have like transit systems that I use when it's a prep flag versus a black flag. You know, it's the same routine. It's the same system. It's the same concepts. And so just, you know, remember that like the boat doesn't know it's a black flag and like you are the one that knows it's a black flag and, and don't let it change the way you behave. Definitely. Um, awesome. And then we have one more from Noah about tips for the round the mark drill. Um, I think 
the biggest thing is just to talk a lot initially um, and really think about what, how the water is moving over your foils and um, like how you can use the sails to help control what you want to do um, and managing your speed. So when you're coming in, um, when you're coming in on starboard to the, to the mark, like making sure you're not coming in too fast, coming in a little bit slower, managing your speed before you shoot head to wind, shoot head to wind, get slow, and then kind of hedge on to port a little bit, slide over, and then reverse. And, and I think it's really about doing it nice and slow and, and trying to just um, talk it out as much as you can as well. And identify anything, anytime you have like a pretty experimental drill like that, I think it's important to say who's experimenting and then the other person should just keep their mouth shut. <laughs> you know, like um, when you first start to do these down speed ones, like just let the skipper mess around with the rudder and see what it feels like and see what it does and let the crew mess around with back winning the main or putting the jib on the opposite side or changing the heel of the boat. But just, you know, identify who's experimenting, change one thing at a time and then have a, a rational ability to say, you know, pass fail on that <laughs> and, uh, and, and make conclusions together make sure you guys are both on the same page about the conclusions you're drawing. Um, but yeah, I think that drill should be pretty, like you should consider it experimental. It's very hard to like have a boat circling a mark without tacking, right? It yeah. takes like a really long time to master that skill. So go into it understanding that it's going to be a little funky for a little while. Yeah. Cool. We have another question from Richard Beers. Um, tell us about your last medal race start and what you were saying to each other. Um, you came from behind. What was that like? <laughs> um, yeah, so our, our last medal race that we did at the Worlds in Geelong in February, um, it was a race that so was kind of all on, all on, and we had, it was a must-win race for us, and we really just focused on our process and doing all these things we just talked about and trying to just keep doing our accelerations and, and trying to nail those and practicing our line sights and getting our, you know, our, our closing distance on the line, doing all those things so that we really felt relaxed and confident um, to execute the start. Um, and then after the start, um, we actually were, we started on the hip of our American competitors and they're really fast in those conditions. And I think it could have been easy to say like, oh, they're fast, like it's gonna be hard to hold the lane. And all we did was put all of our, put all of our energy into how we can sail the boat the best that we can and not think about them. Just think about sailing a good mode, sailing a high mode and just, um, yeah, trusting all the work that we had put into that point. So yeah, I did a lot of visualization about the moment that we were going to pull the trigger, um, you know, trim sails and go, uh, and judging that time and distance. And leading up to the race, I visualized a lot, like, you know, that feeling of being exposed and nervous about being over early, but then actually everything is fine. And, and uh, yeah, I think you can do a lot of, like, positive visual visualization before those important moments. Um, but Steph has another good trick, which is which she taught me early on when we started sailing together. Um, when you start on someone's windward hip, don't look at them. Don't look at the boat to leeward. It's so easy to look at them and focus on them and then not do your job well. Uh, and, and I think that skill was really helpful when we started on the hip of our competition that we needed to beat in that race. <laughs> um, and that's a good Steph trick, yeah. Cool. Those are all really awesome questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Maggie and Steph. It was really fascinating. Some great tips to go faster and certainly have an advantage on your competition. We want to thank all the participants, the sponsors, the presenters, and we look forward to seeing everyone at the next webinar. Thank you, viewers, for joining us. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Good night.